I don't think the story in and of itself is that important. I think what the story represents and the sentiment underlying the players in this story is important. And there is an important lesson to learn here. And what I'm talking about is there was a story that happened earlier this week, and and it's just another example of this. And we're actually going to cover two stories that are kind of similar. It turns out that Charlottesville, Charlottesville is no longer going to celebrate Thomas Jefferson's birthday. This was announced, I believe, early this week, Monday, if I'm not mistaken. And they used to have a holiday, the city of Charlottesville. It wasn't a federal holiday or a state holiday, but the city of Charlottesville had a special event for Thomas Jefferson's birthday to celebrate the man, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote our Declaration of Independence. Celebrate his life, his accomplishments. And now, Charlottesville, which is an increasingly liberal city, it's become, it's kind of like uh, Austin, Texas. That's a pretty good parallel to draw here. And if you know anything about the the culture of either Charlottesville or Austin, Texas, what happened is a bunch of more liberal, progressive-minded people moved there to escape the high taxes. And because of that, it became a much more liberal city even than it already was. Now, cities, especially large cities as a general rule, have been liberal for a long time now, even in the South. I mean, if you're listening to me here in the capital city of Montgomery, you understand that that Montgomery is pretty liberal and tends to vote Democrat, but Wetumpka and Prattville and, and Millbrook and all the surrounding areas are very Republican. But anyway, Austin and Charlottesville have this similar sort of motif, I guess, that when the they, they had this influx of liberals which tended to make the city more liberal and, and they've developed this sort of inside very conservative red states, this sort of very liberal counterculture to where it's not quite, you know, Seattle or LA, but the cultural scene is not that different from it and, and Seattle or sorry, uh, Charlottesville and Austin have been specifically seen as more liberal cities even than, you know, other cities in Texas like Houston and Dallas. That kind of thing. So Austin's kind of seen as Texas's liberal city, and, and the same goes for Charlottesville in North Carolina. So um, Charlottesville has now announced that they are not going to celebrate Thomas Jefferson's birthday. And, I mean, it's, it's blatant virtue signaling because what they're doing is they're not just nixing Jefferson's birthday. They're specifically nixing it and replacing it with what they call Emancipation Day, which is celebrating the emancipation of the slaves. But here's the thing. You can celebrate both. There's no rule that says you can't. And believe me, if you wanted to set a day forward to celebrate the emancipation of slaves, nobody, right or left, is going to have a problem with that. None at all. The problem is, you're specifically trying to virtue signal and trying to drum up people and say, look at how progressive we are. We're getting rid of that 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 day to celebrate that evil racist slave owner Thomas Jefferson and what we're going to do is we're going to bring in this new holiday about the emancipation of slaves look you can do both in fact the emancipation of slaves is something that Thomas Jefferson himself would have celebrated and we'll get to that in a, in just a second but people get Thomas Jefferson so wrong on this Jefferson was not a pro-slavery figure. In fact, I would contend that the only two founders that may be more anti-slavery than Jefferson is Franklin and Rush. And the only reason I say that is because not only were they very critical of it in their personal writings, but they also founded the first abolitionist society. But the truth is, I don't even know that that necessarily makes Jefferson and or sorry, uh, Franklin and Rush more anti-slavery than Jefferson was. He was one of the most anti-slavery of all the founders. And there's a couple things I'd like to point to. First of all, Thomas Jefferson tried to free his own slaves. Now, actually, ironically enough, it is George Washington that is part of the reason that he wasn't able to free his slaves. Because originally, the way that the law stood in the state of Virginia was you can't free dowry slaves, but if you desire your slaves to be free upon your death, that is acceptable. And so you can free your slaves if you want to when you die. 
And that's exactly what Washington did. He freed his slaves, or at least as many of them that weren't dowry slaves, and dowry slaves are ones that are inherited by your wife. When So when he married Martha, he inherited some slaves from her side of the family, and so he couldn't get he couldn't give those slaves his, their freedom, but he did give sla- uh, other slaves his freedom that he owned. So Washington did that upon his death, and when that happened, the state of Virginia reacted directly to that and said, yeah, we're just going to have people not able to free their slaves at all unless they're completely free of debt. Well, what happens when Thomas Jefferson dies? He tries to free his slaves, but the law of Virginia wouldn't allow him to do so upon his death because the man was over $2 million in debt. And we could go through the history of his debt about how he inherited a lot of that from his father and his father-in-law and how that may have not necessarily even really been his fault. Regardless of all that, the point still stands that Thomas Jefferson wanted to free his slaves, expressed that desire on multiple occasions, tried to free his slaves upon his death, and the state of Virginia's law did not allow him to do so. And so you've already got somebody that did the best that he could and tried to free his slaves but was not able to. And then you also have to look back. Thomas Jefferson passed anti-slavery measures when he was a member of the House in the state of Virginia and went to court on three separate occasions to try to get slavery overturned and get it outlawed. Once in the state of Virginia, once at the federal level, and then once again in France. He was even trying to get slavery undone in other countries. That's how anti-slavery this guy was. And while he was president, he tried to get anti-slavery measures through. This guy understood that it was wrong to enslave another person and to have him work for you without compensating him. Have him work for you without his consent. To violate his free will and force him to do something on your behalf. Jefferson understood that was wrong, and we should expect nothing less from the man who said, all men are created equal. And by the way, you will notice in that original draft of the Declaration that I just read, his original draft of the Declaration of Independence. If you'll look at the very first page, you'll notice that in that line where he says all men are created equal, if you were to look at the original Declaration of Independence, it says that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That's not what Jefferson's draft says. It says that all men are created equal and independent. Jefferson understood that slavery was wrong, and he made that case. That was part of his life's work to make sure that the slaves were freed. And when his legislation didn't pass to end slavery, he gave a scathing retort of those that wanted to keep slavery intact, and he lost by one vote. And he said, Oh, to God that I would have been able to change one heart. And then also said, and you're probably familiar with this part of the quote, you just don't understand the context of it. He said, I tremble for my country when I remember that God is just and that his justice will not sleep forever. That was in reference to slavery. He was saying that what we are doing is against God and God will punish us if we don't knock it off. And of course, we know that he was right. The bloodiest war in in American history, the Civil War, took place in large part, not exclusively, but in large part because of slavery. And so Jefferson's prediction came true, and he saw it coming. He understood that God was going to punish us for engaging in the sin of enslaving another human being. And by the way, just to put the last nail in the coffin to any of these ideas that Jefferson was not anti-slavery, let's look back at part of the Declaration of Independence draft that I just read. This is, whoop, that is the wrong graphic. Oh, well, hang on just a second here. I'll just, uh, sorry, I I had a graphic up, but I'm just going to read the the prevalent part here. Now, I want you to, I want to point something out here. And uh, I will point to it whenever I come come to it. This is obviously not an original copy 
of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. I mean, you can see it's, it's printed out on computer paper. But I've seen it. Not in person. I've seen a photo of it. But I've seen Jefferson's original draft. And you notice that when he comes to this paragraph, there is a change in the way that he writes. Jefferson doesn't capitalize things much. In fact, he doesn't even capitalize the first letter of most of his sentences, which the grammar rules were a little different back then. But even whole paragraphs, he does not start with a capital letter. And yet, looking at this particular paragraph of his original draft of the Declaration of Independence, you can see very clearly he starts capitalizing things, even writing things in all caps and bolding them using extra ink. This was the part of the Declaration that he was most fervent about. So I'll go ahead and read this. He has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation hither. So he's saying it's wrong that King George is taking people who have never offended him, never done anything wrong, never taken his property or committed any crimes— that he is stealing them away, taking them away from their homes, bringing them into bondage in another hemisphere, or to die on the slave ship on the way over. So he's calling out the king on being a supporter of slavery, and he continues on. This practical warfare in uh, operibrum uh, of infidel powers, now he, he sort of bears down on his pen here in infidel, you see, what he's doing is he is calling the king of England a heathen for doing this. When he's referring to him as an infidel, he's saying, this man is not a Christian. This man doesn't live the principles of Jesus Christ. That's what it meant to call someone an infidel. Uh, infidel powers is the warfare of the Christian, Christian in all caps, Christian king of Great Britain. In other words, he's saying, how dare you call yourself a Christian and continue to support slavery? And it continues on, determined to keep an open market where men, men is in all caps, should be brought, bought and sold, he has prostituted his negative for suppressing every legislative attempt to prohibit or restrain this execrable commerce. Now, what does execrable mean? It comes from the root word excrement, meaning feces. So, yeah, I mean, it's not exactly a cuss word or anything, not that I think that Jefferson would have condoned that anyway, but he's saying that this commerce basically is human feces. That's how strongly he felt about this. And notice that what he is being critical of specifically is legislation that was anti-slavery, there were two states, Rhode Island and, and uh, uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts, that tried to outlaw slavery completely. And then you also had a couple of other colonies that were trying to pass anti-slavery measures to kind of phase slavery out. So at that time, four colonies trying to get rid of slavery, the king quashed all of them. He said, nope, we are part of the British Empire. You are a British colony. Therefore, you will engage in slavery. You cannot outlaw slavery. Every British citizen has a right to slave to own slaves if they want to. That was the king's rationale. And Jefferson is saying that that policy is crap. I mean, that, that's literally what he's saying in his response to King George quashing any efforts to try to end slavery over here in America. And he continues on and that this assemblage of horrors might want no fact of distinguished die, he is now exciting those very people to rise in arms among us and to purchase that liberty which he has deprived them and murdering the people upon whom he has also ob obtruded them, thus paying off the forms committed against the liberties of one people with crimes which he urges them to commit against the lives of another." And by the way, both liberty and lives in that statement is in bold in Jefferson's original draft. So what's important to understand about that is that 
Jefferson's complaint here is, so the king created a huge human rights violation by going over there, by kidnapping people, and by bringing them over into slavery in this country. And now what he is doing is he is promising freedom to those people by saying, oh, we'll grant you your freedom if you fight for us and kill the people over here in America. If you join forces with us, we'll grant you your freedom. So he's the one that kept this policy in practice. He's the one that started this. And now he's using the very slaves that he himself enslaved to fight his enemies for him, paying off the debt that he owes one person at the expense of American lives. He's saying they should have never been in bondage in the first place, but you put them in bondage and you're saying the only way that they can escape it is if they fight for you against Americans. And so you understand why Jefferson was pretty hot under the collar by all this. But what that does, is, and it finally puts the nail in the coffin, it really proves the point here, that Jefferson was about as anti-slavery as any founder. And was anti-slavery even in comparison to people that came much later. He was even more of an abolitionist, I would say, than a young Abraham Lincoln, who became much more against slavery the older he got. But Jefferson was very vehemently against slavery, and the fact that people nowadays don't understand that just absolutely blows my mind that they think of him as being a pro-slavery figure. There's absolutely no truth to it. Now, I know you're here because you're interested in information on what's going on in the state of Alabama and around the world, and you've come to the right place for that. But it's YouTube, so you could also just be here because you're bored. If you want me to keep making videos to keep you occupied, you need to go ahead and like and subscribe. Otherwise, you're going to have to go back to playing Minesweeper.